I'm particularly thrilled to begin the series with today's guest, Twilight Bay, because the play, Twilight, is named after him and it ends with his words. Twilight grew up in South Central LA and was a key figure in negotiating the Watts gang truce in 1992. He's now an author and ethnographer, cultural critic, community educator, social intervention specialist, and podcaster. He's a co-founder of the Social Solutions Institute and a senior fellow at the Reasoning Think Tank. And he has over 30 years of experience in grassroots activism, racial and social justice organizing, social policy scrutiny, and activist development. Welcome, Twilight. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. So, you know, first of all, uh, here I, I uh, interviewed over 320 people to write Twilight Los Angeles. By the way, the play was supposed to have been in uh, on the stage last May, but the pandemic uh, kept that from happening. And um, so I named it after you. And you get the last word. The last word in any play is very important. It gives uh, you and the audience any, any idea. Uh, my latest play, Notes from the Field, the last word was, for, was given to Congressman John Lewis. So, um, you know, I'm thinking back to when I met you. Here I am in, in LA interviewing people about uh, the riots that had come after, uh, by the way, did you call it a riot or did you call it a revolution or an uprising? What, what did you call it? You called it an uprising. Yeah, that, that was kind of at the time, wasn't it? It was yeah. a bit of a, like, it showed what camp you were in if you called it the wrong thing. Yes, yes. I, I found it interesting that the, the uh, politicians called it the events in LA, which always seemed to me to be a way of escaping it. But I met you uh, at, the, at the home of Jim Brown, the, the football player. Yes. And uh, say a little bit about the work you the work with Jim, I started working with Jim um, as a teenager. Um, I, I've been uh, working in my community to do, a, uh, to do what I could to end the violence that was taking place and to bring, you know, uh, success, to bring it into the violence between the Bloods and Crips, particularly in Watts, California, but in other parts of LA as well, because I went to, I lived in Watts, but I went to school in Inglewood, graduated from high school in Compton, and um, and that in that effort in that in that effort to bring about that change, I, I met a lot of people, and Jim Brown was one of them. And he took me on as a protege, uh, taught me a lot in terms of uh, politics, taught me a lot as, in terms of uh, the responsibility of self determination. Um, he legitimized a lot of the, the work that we were doing in our community because some people were not taking us serious because they figured that we were young. Uh, hoodlums or as uh, Joe Biden and Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton will call us the super predators. That's how people saw us. And Jim was helping people to see us as human beings, um, people who had desires, dreams, hopes, and who wanted to live and not only live, but also be people that can, that can chart our own future and make our lives what we want them to be. And um, working with Jim gave me the opportunity to go into prisons, into schools, and to neighborhoods, not only in Los Angeles and the various parts of California, but across the, the United States and eventually the world. Uh, working with a former member of the Black Panther Party, Michael Zinzin, who, was, who I was the protege of him as well, uh, who was the co-founder of the Coalition Against Police Abuse. That took me international. And Michael was uh, very instrumental in helping me to understand and hone my skills as a grassroots community organizer and helped me to understand what the importance of linking uh, local, national, and international struggle. So he sent me to Brazil when the police were killing the street children in Brazil. He sent me to international uh, uh, conferences uh, involving young um, African heritage people from around the world in different countries, including Germany, um, Paris, uh, England, and you know, and that just it just kept rolling from there. So I had the opportunity to not only learn hone my skills and, and, and be able to work with my peers, but I also had the opportunity to sit at the feet of some of the greats, Winnie Mandela, Kwame Toure, uh, Jamil Amin, better, um, some people know him as H. Rap Brown. All of these people were the people who helped to shape my understanding of what needed to be done and the work that I was doing. Yes, I mean, so um, that's uh, 
we, we should talk a little bit more about that because I know you're probably doing something like that in England right now, which is how basically uh, becoming political uh, and really understanding your circumstances can save your life. But, you know, speaking about uh, a, a, um, an expanded understanding, I'm thinking about a story that you told me. Um, we went out to breakfast and uh, you told me a story of what that something that happened to you in a parking lot outside of a grocery store. Okay, so um, I think you're talking about the incident where I was waiting for my mother in the car in the parking lot, and I had my uh, my my daughter with me, who was probably about two three months old, and uh, these guys um, wanted to, um, you know, they was coming to get me. They were they were looking to, to to do me some harm that day. And I had to make a decision. Do I wait for my mother? Or do I get my daughter to safety? And, um, and and I chose to get my daughter to safety. And I had to come back and and and, and get my mother. Um, but that was a that was a crucial day. And this is what was mo motivating me to do the things that I was doing. Because my daughter's mother, she was from the same neighborhood that these guys were from. And so you know I couldn't raise my daughter or let her inherit the legacy of that. And um, even today, my daughter lives and moves around with bloods and crips and don't have to deal with that reality. And I, I, I'm glad that I was able to achieve some element of that kind of uh, secession of violence in a certain context for her. But that, that, was, a, that was a very crucial day and a, and a, made, and a, and a motivating factor to, to continue the work that I was doing. And didn't they pull a gun on you right there with your daughter in the car? Yeah, yeah they, they pulled a gun on me right then and there. And um, you know it wouldn't be the it wouldn't be the last time. I remember going to visit my daughter at her mom's home in their neighborhood, and that day um, I pulled up outside the home, and two guys, you know, come up to the car. One had a gun, put the gun in the window, asked me to get out of my car. Um, I recognized what was going on. I got out of my car, gun in my face. They asking me for the keys. I dropped the keys by the cars to let, you know, because I knew that they were, they were going to want the keys. And I said, didn't you hear me drop the keys by the car? And um, what I'd actually done is drop my house keys and have my car keys in my pocket because I needed to keep that car in order to be able to work. Um, I couldn't work. I couldn't, I, I couldn't get to work. I couldn't take care of my daughter. So um, ultimately, it, it, it ended up being an um, altercation with these guys. I fortunately was able to grab the gun, um, uh, take the clip out of the gun. Uh, while one guy was holding me, he was taller than me, so he lifted me up off the ground. The other one was beating me across my face. And I just, I just started, I just, you know, held the clip in one hand and fought these dudes and was calling out for my daughter's mother to come out. And once she came out and they heard, they saw that people were coming to see what was going on, they scampered off. And, um, you know, a lot of people questioning, um, a lot of my peers questioning why wouldn't I let them retaliate for what had happened. And I said, well, if I let you retaliate, what's going to stop you from shooting a member of my daughter's family? What's going to stop you from potentially um, escalating the situation even further to where my daughter and her family is at risk? Um, and a lot of my friends um, from my particular side of town didn't agree with it, but they respected my views on it. And uh and they and they held their position, even though that they even though they were quite angry about it. But I told them that, you know, what I'm doing, this is what it's about. Gotta be willing to do what's right in spite of what happens. And I knew that these individuals didn't really understand. And I knew that they struggled, they were struggling themselves. Um and as a result of that, you know, I could still see their humanity, even though I was in a confrontation with them and fighting for my life at the time. But it, 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 what, I, what interests me about this story in particular is change. You know, right now we're in a moment that people call at least a moment of reckoning where we expect things to change. And so you're a person who has changed, you've helped change uh, uh, as a result of those things that happened to you. You became one of the architects of the gang truce in, in Los Angeles at a time that, you know, gang life was really uh, very robust. So when, when you think about what, what it takes to change as a person and as a society, 
What would you say it is? What I think it takes to change is that um, there has to be a burning desire. There has to be a desire that's so intense that nothing else could, could, could it's, like, it's like a fire that can never be quenched. Nothing can stop it. And unfortunately, I don't see that kind of fire in the United States as an, as an entity. Right. I mean, and that, let's, let's, let's talk about that for a minute, because I think that's, again, really important at this moment, post the murder of George Floyd. A lot of people are calling what's going on now, and of course it's worldwide, they're calling it unprecedented. Never mm -hmm. happened before. Do you agree, or do you think this is uh, more of the same, or, or how do you think about the world response to watching uh, George Floyd practically lynched in, in, in front of the world? I don't think that is unprecedented. I think the advent of social media gives it a greater amplification. I believe that it's a continuation of what it has been. Um, and I also think about the countless others. I was a member of the Co October 22nd coalition who put together the Stolen Lives Project. And they have a book with hundreds of pictures in it of people that's been killed by the police in the United States in similar ways and worse ways over decades. And for me, I was just looking at the situation and wondering where was the critical analysis. It was good to see that people were speaking up. It was good that some people were forced to, to come to terms with what they were seeing. Um, but whether or not that would turn into the type of energy that was needed to bring about a fire that could pretty much consume all of the history of the United States, all of the history that's linked to um, England, because there's over 3,000 deaths in custody in England, and not one police officer has been prosecuted. Black people are killed here in the same kind of way. Stop and search operates here the same way it operated in New York is stop and frisk. Black young men are three times of three to four times more likely to be stopped by the police, although <clears throat> when when you look at um the smaller number of, of whites who are stopped by the police, they're the ones who are actually caught with drugs. So three times more black young men are being stopped by the police, but they make up less than 3% of the population. How is that? You know, so to create that kind of burning desire to consume all of that, I don't think that, that I see that burning desire there. You don't feel it. You don't feel it. How did gang life fit into the story <clears throat> of the Los Angeles uprising? Well, this goes back to the, in, the, in the 1980s, Reaganomics, uh, people were coming out of school. We had been going to school our whole, going to school, coming out of high school, looking to go into work. A lot of the industries that we had in Los Angeles had been moved out due to tax-based changes, jobs being moved overseas and things of that nature. The inner cities were now being downsized in a sense. There was no work. And just as that happened, there seemed to be cocaine, crack cocaine, falling from the sky all over South Central Los Angeles. The gangs had all, always been there. The violence had never been at the levels that we eventually saw them in 1985. Gang members used to get into confrontations with each other and it was about bravado. It was about bragging rights. It was about uh, neighborhood pride. And sometimes <clears throat> rock fights, bottles, chains get involved, but never um, the level of gun, gun violence that came with crack cocaine. And with that crack cocaine, it didn't necessarily become really tragic until the war on drugs. 
And when the war on drugs came, it seemed as if the tap was turned off for the flow of cocaine. When they went in, when they went into Panama, went out to Manuel Noriega, it seemed like it all got cut off. And when it got cut off, coming from the east, eastern part of the United States, down through the Midwest, into California, it all of a sudden reemerged. And it was now coming through um, Mexico into California. Now, the thing about that is that in their first initial impact of that change, people were robbing each other. Brothers, cousins, didn't matter. Same gang, different gang. For the control of the little bit of drugs that was left. People had become addicted to the new lifestyle. We never knew that we were poor until we saw the lifestyle of the rich and famous, the Robin Lynch. And now we had a taste of that, and people wanted that. Got a little bit of it, then all of a sudden, it was getting turned off. <clears throat> people wanted to keep that going. And in trying to keep that going, violence became more and more a part of the picture. And as a part of that picture, individuals in our community, parents, called out for something to be done. And Police Chief Bill Gates came in with Operation Hammer. And Operation Hammer was relentless. Whether you're using a gang or not, you get swept up in gang sweeps. They were going into junior high schools, asking young people if they were in gangs. And young people were filling out documents, not knowing what these documents meant. And this data was utilized to set up a gang task force, create a gang database, made, a, made things worse. And as a result of the police having this uh, green light to crack down on young black men, there was a whole lot of police brutality, even more than what had been before. And I had been a victim of it at 14, 12, 12, 12 and 14. Friends of mine had been victims of it. We didn't know if anybody would ever believe us, but eventually it got caught on tape. And when it got caught on tape, everybody said, finally, finally now somebody will believe us. That now we're not always out here doing mad things. Police just come through and victimizing people. And that's what was taking place. And in the community where I grew up in Watts, because of his legacy with the Panther Party and the US organization, a lot of the old guys in the neighborhood, the older guys, they will fight the police back. And so we had become accustomed to fighting back. It was a war. It was yes. a war. Yes. And that was the nature of what was happening. And then there was a police killing of a gentleman by the name of Henry Pico in the Imperial Courts housing projects, and one of my peers, Dwayne Holmes, um, it was his cousin. He wanted to bury his cousin without worrying about gang conflict, and went and met with their rivals and said, can we do this? The police killed my cousin. We don't want no drama at the funeral. We just want to bury him in peace. And that became his entry into the movement for peace in the neighborhoods as well. And so, this legacy and this history, going back to the 65 riots and before, has always been a part of our reality there. You're, 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 you're helping create the gang truce wasn't just to keep brothers from killing brothers, but it was also a strategic move to try to get less violence in the neighborhoods and then maybe to get Daryl Gates and the LAPD off your back. Exactly. We were aware of what was taking place in our community. We were aware of the Na Natasha Harlan's killing. And, the, and, and, and we was aware that <clears throat> when Natasha Harlan was killed, what happened in, in the courts with the, with the woman who was responsible for her death. Shun Jadu. Shun Jadu. And we just felt that if a person can get more time for killing their dog than this person got, for the death of Natasha Harlan, then what do they think of us? As our, our, lives, our lives 
a dog's life is more important than ours. And we wanted to change that. And we, and, we, and we wanted to not only change that, but we wanted to put an end to what had been taking place in our communities. And you know, it's, I think it's important to point out too, uh, Twilight, that the, uh, the expression, no justice, no peace, which appears to be assigned to this particular era of uh, protests against police brutality, uh, probably starting this time with Trayvon Martin, that that, that really uh, came out of the story of Latasha Harlins. And in some ways, I asked Zinzin this, Michael Zinzin, he disagreed. I thought uh, that no justice, no peace had replaced all power to the people, which was of course the Panther slogan. And at the time he said, oh no, 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 ain't nothing gonna be as big as all power to the people. But I think no justice, no peace has taken over in terms of a rallying cry along with Black Lives Matter. Well, I think when you talk about no justice, no peace, I can hear it as a rallying cry. However, if you don't understand or deal with the unresolved question of black people and their legacy and history in the United States and what it means to give back to the people that have their power to have control and determination over their own lives, then you don't really understand what no justice, no peace is really about. One of the things I told one of my students is that sovereignty is better than the demand for justice or police reform. Hmm. And I said, that's one thing people who were classified as Negroes, who have no international personality, who has no international representative in the United Nations, who have no voice to take to the stage of the global community that can operate independently of the United States and criticize and critique the United States treatment of African heritage people who are in the United States as a result of the enslaved Africans who were their ancestors. And when I look at my, I tell people, I say, you know, I actually show people my birth certificate. And I say, look what it says on the nationality. And when they see the word Negro, they're blown away. They can't believe it. I say, this is a political designation handed down to my ancestors in which I carry today. We can't have a demand for justice. We can't even organize to disrupt peace without first being recognized fully as human beings. Well, how will we do that? How, how will we do that? What's, uh, what's, what's that movement about? How do we get to that? <clears throat> well, I know Ice Cube is called for black people to have a contract with the United States instead of just voting in this current upcoming election because of black faces in high places telling them to. And I can see his point because we never had a social contract with the United States as, as African descent people as a result of enslavement that, that are in the United States. We never had a social contract with them. However, when you look at the Eurocentric laws, the United States is a Eurocentric entity it has unearned privilege, unjust power, and, it's, and, and, and that's what makes it unworkable in every way for what is classified as a Negro. When you take that argument to the global stage, and with this being the decade as well, the international decade for, the, for, for, for people of African descent, which, uh, was, which has been brought about by the United Nations um, uh, education and science um, <clears throat> on, on UNESCO. Why did they? Why did they say that? Why did they have a de <clears throat> a dedicated um, international day? I mean, international decade for people of African descent. That's because we are still fighting to be recognized as human. We're still fighting for our for our just <clears throat> and, and independent and autonomous right to exist as people and have control over our own lives. And as a result of that, African Americans particularly have a particular type of displacement. They don't have an international identity. Citizenship is a political instrument. It can be taken away at any point in time. Governments can take that away from you. So, wait a minute. so Twilight, when you talk about having an international identity, 
has uh, going to England and living in England expanded that for you? This was something that I was aware of when I was 17, 18 years of age. And as I studied and as I learned and as I developed in this work over the last 30 years, it has become the burning. It has become the new fire. Because instead of a contract with America, we need a treaty. Wow. We need to be recognized as an autonomous, non-territorial, sovereign group of people and have our own seat in the United Nations where we elect our own representative that sits there so that we can engage in political and economic discussions with our own ambassadors separate from the United States so that we can negotiate a treaty with the United States because this is something that will supersede all of the laws of the United States. So Twilight, you, you really become more radical uh, <laughs> since we talked. I would say at that time you were, uh, you know, I remember you telling me uh, really, and I think this is because of, of, of the gang truce, I would say that you were on a more, um, uh, more, uh, a more spiritual sort of, 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 of hunt, you know? Uh, and that goes back to, to what your name is, right? So I'm gonna read just the last part of the last words that you told me that end the play. You say, I ask you about what Twilight is, and you say, uh, uh, it's like I'm stuck in limbo, like the sun is stuck between night and day in the twilight hours. I'm in an area not many people exist. Nighttime to me is like a lack of sun. I don't affiliate darkness with anything negative. I affiliate darkness with what was first because it was first. And then relative to my complexion, I am a dark individual. And with me being stuck in limbo, I see the darkness as myself. I see the light as the knowledge and the wisdom of the world and the understanding of others. And here's the important part, Twilight, that I want you to remark on and how you feel about it now. And in order for me to be a true human being, I cannot forever dwell in darkness. I can't forever dwell in the idea just identifying with people like me and understanding me and mine. So I, I took that to mean that your antidote to this violence, uh, to this thievery of your dignity, your antidote to that uh, uh, was education and understanding that it can't be just about you. I mean, where are you in that right now? I'm, I'm still in that same place. I think it, it has evolved and matured. At one point in time, it was about understanding what I've been being taught by my, by my elders in my community. <clears throat> I didn't have their, their wisdom because I had not lived and walked the path that they've walked. Now that I've had my feet on the journey for 30 years, now I can, I can say, I can see from another place that in order for me to give the greatest humanity that I'm capable of giving, to the world, the people who have been the victims of all of the violence, all of the most terrible things, the longest legacy of dehumanization of a people on the planet. They have the potential to bring a level of humanity to the planet that the planet has never seen. Because those who feel it, know it. Those who know it, know what it takes to reverse it and change it. If given the opportunity, free from cultural hegemony, Free from, free from manipulation and distraction with fringe agendas and, 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 <clears throat> and political uh, uh, tokenism, we can actually get to a place to where we can teach the world to do something different, to do something better. And we can bring the world to a better place. And I've learned that that's what it takes. I had to not only learn about what the world had to teach me, but I had to learn my place within the world. And my experience and the things that I've been through have taught me what it takes for a person to know what it, what it means to truly be humane. When I have stopped my car to stop young people attacking other young people in the streets of London, when I've gone into the most dangerous favelas in Brazil in spite of what people have said to inspire them to do different, when I've gone into Oslo, Norway, to inspire young people there 
to not copy the self-destructive um, lifestyle that have been popularized through film and media that were portraying us a certain way, but not necessarily telling the essence of what we had been through that brought us to that place. Being able to go into neighborhoods that are neighborhoods that are traditionally neighborhoods of people who would be on the side of the far right and working with their children and helping their children to recognize what the crime was and what had been done wrong and why certain words and languages is not okay to use and what's required in order to make the world a better place for all of us. And in some you, cases- You're still straddling. I'm, I'm pleased to see that in fact, you are still in that, that, that twilight space, there's, there's space uh, between night and day and you're willing to go where you would not be necessarily um, to make a difference. My last question for you uh, is about what would you tell the young actor who I don't even know if he was born in uh, 1992, and I, I'm pretty sure his life story is very, very different than yours. Um, what three things would you tell that actor are critical to be able to play you, to appear to be you? What three things are, are critical for him to know? Um, <clears throat> empathy. <clears throat> a strong and a strong and committed sense of social justice and a love and an admiration for your culture and the history and the legacy of that culture and the represent and the, and the recognition that you are the living breathing representation of every ancestor that you ever had and when you speak you speak the voices of millions not just one wow so what a thing for that actor to bring <clears throat> to end the play and understanding that he's really not speaking uh, just as Twilight Bay, but he's speaking a, a long legacy, that he's speaking the voice of ancestors. Twilight, thank you so much. You are such a positive person. And I think that's why I decided to, you were very inspiring to me. Uh, I want to thank you again for everything you gave me. You gave me courage when I was writing that play. I, I sat with you at breakfast early on and you gave me the courage to know that I could tell this big story. And I think it's because uh, of your kindness. I felt a great kindness from you to me. And I would say that would be another thing that our actor should end the play with is exuding the kind of kindness that lives in Twilight, lives in you, even as you are determined uh, to rid us of the things that are violent. Thank you so much. Thank you.